Okay, so first I want to thank the organizers for inviting me for this fascinating and very interesting symposium. <coughs> Next, I want to obviously uh, to thank the, my colleagues that I won't forget in the Hebrew University, all my students, and here you have Ramon Abraham, and you have Mondal Rama, that is, they are both here. And in, also in the Hebrew University, I have another collaboration with um, Leonard Eitan, Institute of Chemistry with Asaf Friedberg, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, Tel Aviv University. I have a long-standing, fantastic collaboration with Nir Bentan, who is also here somewhere. And in Germany, in Max Planck Institute of Biophysics in Frankfurt, I have also a very long-standing collaboration since 1996 with Hartmut Michel and his group. And in Max Planck also, I have another collaboration with the group of uh, Klaus Fendler. Okay, now, portable sodium are the most common ion. Protons are used by almost every enzyme in the cell, in the organelle, and protons are used in uh, uh, bioenergetics processes, they store and or transduce energy. And obviously, Peter Mitchell was the one that got the Nobel Prize for the chemiosmotic theory explaining how is the proton is used in bioenergetics. And sodium, how sodium is used was discovered later. Yet, when the concentration of sodium and protons are too high or too low, they turn into potent stress stressors, very potent, uh, very stressors to cells and to organelles. Therefore, every cell and organelle must have homeostatic regulation mechanism to keep constant the sodium concentration and the proton concentration in the cell. Now, Peter Mitchell also discovered the, um, the sodium proton antiporter activity in bacterial cells and mitochondria. And he actually predicted that these antiporters have a primary role in homeostasis of proton and sodium <coughs> in all cells and organelles. Now, over the 40 years since his discovery, almost all his predictions have been realized. Sodium proton antiporters are present in the cytoplasmic membrane of almost every cell and also in the organelle membranes. They are critical to cell homeostasis of intracellular pH and also organelle. So a constant intra-organal pH, and as a result also of volume. Now, impaired function of certain sodium proton antiporters is involved in pathological syndrome. And these antiporters, therefore, have, been, have long been drug targets, and I'll mention a little bit about it later. Now, cloning the energy A gene which encodes for the main sodium proton antiporter of a coli, opened the field to molecular biology combined with physiology, biochemistry, biophysics, and eventually to structural biology. Energy A is the principal sodium proton antiporter of a coli, enterobacteria, and other bacteria, and is indispensable for the homeostasis of sodium and proton. Now, the purified NHA protein reconstituted into proto-liposomes revealed the functional characteristic of NHA. It is very fast, one of the fastest transporters, 
you can see it here, almost like a channel. Uh, uh, H proton sodium stoichiometry is two, and therefore it is electrogenic. In other words, in every cycle, because it's not sim uh, equal numbers of proton and sodium, you actually uh, produce a charge, a net charge. And it's drastically dependent on pH, a property that it shares with many eukaryotic antipodes. Okay. Now, the genome project at the beginning, uh, actually there were only about 100 uh, sequences of putative antipodes, and Milton Sir uh, divided them into sub, uh, subfamily, uh, first to superfamily, monovalent cation proton antipoda, CPA, then to CPA and CPA2 based on the, what they used to do. And here you can see that C the CPA, which includes, you see, the human, the human ones, NHE1211, and they are really involved in failures in the heart, in the kidney, stomach, cancer, energy 9 in autism, and other uh, syndromes. Now, CPA2, it's, as you see here, it is involved in essential hypertension and diabetes. And here is Escherichia coli and NJA. Obviously, the breakthrough was when we uh, succeeded in overexpression and purification of the NJA that led re really to structure determination. Now, what are the structure inside provided by the crystal structure? Because we are talking now, uh, now about something which is very dynamic, and you'll see later. So what first are the structural inside provided by the crystal? OK, you have 12 uh, transmembrane domains. You have a cytoplasmic funnel, periplasmic funnel. And here you can see already inverted repeats. I don't want to see all of them. I just pinpoint about two which are inverted. You can see them here. And they are interrupted in the middle by extended shape. And this was, at that, at that time, it was a fight with the editors, obviously, of nature, because in the middle of the membrane you have uh, extended chain. <laughs> what does it mean? OK. But because it's not really, it's not uh, uh, saturated by hydrogen bonds, and it is flexible, it can accommodate ions. And here is the active site, and I'll talk to, about it later. OK. Now, this fold is a new fold. It's called now uh, the energy A fold. And since we discovered this fold, and why it is unique, it is unique because it is inverted. Yeah? It, it is ext extended chains connected to small helices. So it brings about two pluses to face each other, two minuses to face each other. So that's very unique. What it means that in the middle of the membrane, you have a very delicate, delicate environment uh, electrostatically. And obviously, this is very important for activity. And, uh, um, OK, and the number of the uh, transporters with the energy fold is increasing with time. And you can see them here, and there are already more. OK, so what are the functional insights? And I started by telling that that's, it's really a nanomachine. What does it do? Energy A. Yeah, it exchanges sodium or lithium from one side of the, across the membrane with protons from the other side of the membrane. And it belongs to the secondary transporter that harness 
the downhill energy of an ion gradient to drive uphill active transport of a second substrate. Consequently, its activity mechanism can be described by the alternate access model by Jodeski, uh, you see, 1966. But this is a concept. It's not the mechanism. There are some people that, for them, that's enough. But if you want really to, to know the mechanism, how this nanomachine works, you need to know several things. What do you need to know? You need to know the active site. You need, but that's not enough. You need to know the determinants of the active site. In other words, the rate of binding, what are the conditions that affect binding, and so on and so forth. Next, you need to know what every residue know in the, in the protein does. You need to know the different conformation, as we heard along this uh, very interesting conference. But that's not enough, again, because it, it's uh, dynamic. So you need to know the dynamics of the conformational changes. And the six million question, how energy is coupled? OK. Now, the energy APH4 crystal structure opened the way to structure based in the disciplinary approaches that I don't think that they could otherwise have been applied. So we were very happy with it. And let's start with the binding sun. OK, the, stru the structure here, you have a section of the molecule. And the structure immediately tells you that aspartate 164 is near the funnel. So it must be something connected with the active site and next to it another aspartate. OK. And we know that in other uh, transporters, that even are not homology or homologous to energy A, but they share the same form. The active site is right there. And this is at the crossing of the extended chain, chains that I showed you. OK. So obviously, because this is a, a, they are most conserved residues, because they are in the active site, and, one, and they are essential. You cannot replace them, because they are in the active site. But what about the determinants? What affect the binding? So you have to take the protein, and you have to take the substrate. In this case, this is lithium, because lithium has affinity tenfold higher than sodium. And we, it was very, we were very successful with this in I, we, uh, using ITC. You can see it here. But it was also very disappointing, because we couldn't see sodium. And sodium, rather than lithium, is the one that, interests, that is interesting physiologically. Lithium hardly exists around. OK. So what are we going to do? Uh, this open question, obviously. Because if, if, so, if the uh, antiporter is the one that is responsible for the pH homeostasis, then the, the affinity must be similar to the concentration of the cytoplasm, et cetera, et cetera. So recently, um, we had very nice, we had very nice collaboration with, uh, in Columbia University in New York with Ma, uh, Ma, uh, with Quick, Matthias Quick, and he actually developed the SPA. I don't know if all of you are acquainted with it, scintillation proximity assay. And he could, we could very nicely get the sodium binding. And you can see it here. And you can see it here. And it really uh, nicely shows the pH dependence. 
So it means that the pH dependent of energy A is actually the pH dependent of the sodium binding. And the KD, it's 0.4 millimolar, and it's very similar to the apparent KM and to the intracellular sodium concentration. So this is unpublished yet. OK, now I'm coming to the great collaboration with Neil Bental in Tel Aviv University and his great student. Actually, you should have known by now that he always has good students. One is Metal, and uh, the other one, where is he? <laughs> OK. Um, so, and I'm talking about Gal Maserati. And now, as I told you before, we, uh, at the beginning of the, of the uh, genome project, there were 100 or something. But now there are 6, 000, more than 6,000 um, sequences of mutative sodium proton antipotents. So what they did, actually, and that's, I think it's amazing, uh, they found eight residues, the most conserved residues, that really form a motif. And you can see the motif here. First of all, it is highly conserved, as I said. Second, it is not linear. You can see it here. It's on different helices. Its residues, indeed, cluster around the binding site. And variation in the motif by evolutionary analysis, and if you have questions, you can ask exactly uh, near how he got, uh, they got to it, that the variation in the motif distinguishes between CPA1 and CPA2, and as well, they uh, reveal the transport determinants. What I mean, that, for example, what they came to conclusion, that this residue must uh, affect the active site. So obviously, immediately, we did uh, mutations according to their instructions, and the mutation was done by Rama and Ramon. And here you see all the residues around, and here are the mutations. I'm going to, we are already in all these mutations, but I'm going to mention only the first one, the double mutant. You can see it here. This T, uh, exactly what you see here, what you see here. And amazingly, the question is whether really it affects the binding site. Well, I told you about D163 and D164, but this is around them. Okay, so here they are. This is a double mutant. Immediately it shows you that, it, that this is without sodium stress. This is with sodium stress. This one doesn't grow. This one, it doesn't grow in lithium, and obviously it doesn't grow at alkaline pH. So something is really impaired. Now, the DM mutant doesn't uh, have any activity in proto-liposomes, any activity. But it binds lithium. And this is actually the first mutation that we have, a mutation that doesn't function, but still it binds. And moreover, it is pH independent. So clearly, we are in a very uh, a great position to continue, and I, I, want, I don't want to spare more time on it. OK. So what do we know about energy, energy, other energy residues? I don't want. Uh, obviously, we use the cytorected uh, mutations and so on, and everything is uh, published. And we looked for 
uh, residues, the change conformation, again side directed, and we have many, and I'm not going to talk about it. Now, what, but the question, the big question is what happens with the other parts of the protein at the same time? Does the protein move together? Is the movement coordinated? And uh, several approaches, obviously crystal structure. Now as yet, neither we nor other groups have the crystal structure of the open conformation. But I think that we are now very close to it by single particle uh, cryo -EM, but I'm not going to talk about it yet. Uh, but what we could do, we could, uh, what are the other approaches that I mentioned? Obviously, structural based computation and HDX mass. And HDX mass has not been mentioned in this conference up to now. And I think it's, it's a very uh, potent technique to see how these nanomachines work. And this, obviously, I don't need to, to tell this uh, audience what is HDX mass. Uh, what we did, we took energy A, pure 5 energy A, we put it in the auditorium and for a different time periods, and then obviously you quench, you digest with trypsin in this case, and you do chromatography, and you get the, the uh, peptides, and you do mass spectroscopy. So you can see where, where it is uh, accessible and where it's not. And when you, uh, the results, you can see here, hopefully I'll be able, no. Thank you. So you can see here that there's at the circumference of the molecule, it is exposed because this is green. And here in the core region, it is also exposed, but less. And here at the active site, it is not exposed at all. It doesn't exchange with the deuterium. And this was a surprise because it was against our competitors. And now, uh, the, the, what you saw before, it was the negative uh, <coughs> and control without lithium. And here you can see what we did in the presence of lithium. And actually, what you see here is the differential, one uh, minus the other. And you see that there are places, like the dark blue, which really are exposed and exchange the deuterium, and there are areas like here that the reverse, they have minus what the control has. Okay, so if now, and as I said, the active site doesn't do anything, doesn't change. Now, Obviously, we should have done it with a negative control, with a dead mutant, and the dead mutant doesn't show anything, and everything is on the viable energy. Good. Now, what we could do, and that was very, very helpful, on the topology of, uh, uh, of energy, we could uh, uh, reflect all the changes, 
And what you see, it's very interesting that in one side of the helix, it's more accessible, whether it's reverse on the other side, which is less, which means that the helix moves. It's in the margin, but it must move. And so we could trace, actually, the changes from one side, from the active side to the, towards the N-terminus, and from the active side towards the C-terminus. And we got a very nice model that you can see here. This is the funnel. So there is movement between the two domains between the, uh, across the funnel. And obviously, these changes you can see here by, uh, more schematically. Uh, will open the cytoplasmic funnel, close the periplasmic funnel, and vice versa. Okay. Okay, but energy up to now, I was talking about the energy A monomer. But energy A is a dimer. And this we know for many years, I think it's one of the, I think the first, if I recall well, that we did together with Kulbrandt, also in Max Planck Institute. And this is the old cryo-EM, very simple, Williams did it. And you see that it is a dimer. So Ramon Abraham, uh, before I tell you that another structure of energy A uh, was obtained by uh, David Drew and and they were still in London. So that's uh, Soe Vata, David Drew, and Cameron. And they are spread all over now. They are not in England. Uh, ah, David uh, Cameron is in, in, in England. Uh, OK. So there is another, there is another. Uh, structure, which is very similar to the, the, uh, the structure that we got, with changes that I don't want to go now into it. And you see that it immediately it, uh, we can ask, oh, what keeps the dimer in energy? So in the periplasm, you have beta sheet that you see here. In the cytoplasmic side, these are these helices that interact. Here they are. So we decided to cut them, cut this, cut this, cut both of them. Also part of it was done together with near Bentham. OK. And Ramon Avraham uh, actually was the master of this work. And you see, when you uh, uh, cut the beta sheet, or you cut the, the helices on the other side, you, got, you get from dimer, you got monomers, and this is a native gel. And, and the monomers are active. All the mutants, they are not so active as the wild type, but they are active. But they are less stable. Definitely, you can see here, they are more, this is the wild type. And this the monomer, and they are more sensitive uh, to, to temperature. You see that they start aggregating. And also, they don't, uh, under stress condition, extreme stress condition, they can't grow. OK, so this was clear. Next, next, you heard from Carol the beautiful work platform that showed, uh, I think, uh, yes, you gave the talk yesterday, <laughs> that showed how you can isolate the protein, the proteins with the uh, lipids, if they bind lipids. And they, here you see the, the, uh, the reference, and they showed by mass spectroscopy that Energy A, like lutein, binds cardiolipin. 
And this excited us because we are still working on, on structure. And obviously, this is very important. So we decided to see if we can learn about the interaction between cardiolipin and energy. And we decided, and Raymond did it, and uh, really with a very straightforward approach. First of all, if it needs uh, cardiolipin, it needs a lipid, we can delipidate it, because the detergent are known to delipidate the protein. So that was a very simple experiment and very successful, and you can see it here. Just because uh, this guy was crystallized with DDM, or the silmaltoside, but if you increase the concentration from dimers, you get monomers. And that's stable. Fine. Now, if we get it, and they are stable monomers, and if indeed for dimerization you need cardiolipin, then you add cardiolipin to the monomers and see what you get. You see, beautiful dimers just by reconstitution. So I think it's also very important to, to uh, as I really uh, uh, know that this very simple experiment can very help really to see the, par the lipid partners that are needed for membrane proteins just by reconstitution. Okay. But you know that E. coli has not only cardiolipin, cardiolipin actually is the least phospholipid of E. coli. The other one is phosphoglycerol, 20%, uh, and P, P, uh, phosphodidylethanolamine, 75%. So obviously, we compared it. We compared it again by the reconstitution. But you see immediately that cardiolipin is the optimal guy. Uh, PG can also do it, but much less efficient. And PE, which is the major phospholipid, doesn't do it. OK, but this was in vitro. And we wanted to test it in vivo. So you know that in E. coli, you have many mutants. And you have one, mu one more than one mutant that doesn't synthesize cardiolipin. So obviously, what we should have done, and we did it, to uh, express it the, uh, in this mutant. And this is what you get. You, we also, or maybe we go straight to the uh, growth experiment, and you see that without cardiolipin in this mutant, uh, this is it. This is the water. And this is without cardiolipin, you see that it doesn't grow. It's sensitive. And now we know actually why it has a phosphoglycerol in the background. But the dimers that you see here are not very stable. And you can see here that if the, the if you take the isolate the protein from these guys and you uh, expose it to, uh, for example, 0.015 uh, DDM, and you compare it to the wild type, the wild type doesn't do anything. But here, it actually completely uh, turns it into monomers. OK. So cardiorebrin is important for energy dimer assembly and functionality. So where does it bind? In the, in the crystal structure of uh, David Drew and Alex and uh, Soi Wata that I showed you, they actually show, so, uh, showed a density at one side. And this is the beta sheet. And this is actually the interface 
which they claimed are full of lipids, and they found the density, that they, no resolution that we could say exactly what it is, but they uh, implied that maybe it's a cardiolipin. So cardiolipin is a potential anion. So we decided to look at the cations, the potential cations, and you can see in this area, you can see them here, the arginines, and uh, actually about four arginines. And we, uh, Rama mutated them, Rama and Ramon again mutated them. And to make the story short, uh, they uh, are the two, four, five, these mutants don't do anything, and this mutant actually only in the membrane they hold, but we cannot uh, purify them. So we believe that this is part of the binding site, but obviously we are waiting for the crystal structure. Uh, and Rama succeeded in docking the cardiolipin here, exactly according to what we discovered. And it looks nice, but we are waiting, waiting for the crystal structure. And thank you very much. That's very nice, Satana. Um, I was just wondering, you said that you couldn't see the sodium binding by the ITC in your original experiments. I'm wondering if you had the cardiolipin added now and repeated it, do you think you might see that? Uh, it's a very good question, actually. Have we done it? No. <laughs> we should do it. <laughs> it's a very good question. Uh, well, this is a new paper, it just came out now, so, but thank you, yeah, it's a good idea. Whilst we're on sodium binding by ITC, I wonder, do, you, do you have any idea why it didn't work, because you could measure the binding by, by other means? But you, because you cannot increase the sodium concentration tenfold, you see? Otherwise, maybe it would have worked, but the machine doesn't allow you. Okay. I, I have a more general question. How, how, you know, it's involved in homeostasis, but how does it, in, does it interact with the sodium potassium ATPase, which is also involved in Maintaining sodium and well, this is E. coli. Right? Oh, okay, there's no sodium potassium. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. But uh, it's a good question because obviously the energy is, yeah, in eukaryotic cells when you have sodium. Uh, and there's no transporter in eukaryotes. Oh I yeah, mean, there the, is. The energy is. Yeah. And the energy is, they work in the other direction because in the eukaryotic cells. It's more important to, uh, to at a lower pH, because they don't go to alkaline pH. Mm -hmm. Only bacteria can do it, yeah? So they are working the other way around. The set point is different. Right, and there do they interact? Does the pump interact with the antiport? Sure, sure. The, the pump uh, bring in, brings in potassium, which is yes, needed. but there's a, is there some cross-regulation is what I mean. If there is, uh, well, there's no, uh, as far as I know, there is no interaction. Okay. Well, let's thank Aitana very much for a wonderful <laughs>